coming up on This Week in Radio Tech. It's late at night in Amsterdam, but it's uh, going to be a great show anyway. I've got Matt Levin here along with Hans von Zutphen. We're talking audio processing on PCs and amazing technology. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Telos Alliance and the Zipstream 9X2 processing and streaming software. Choose from hardware and software solutions for your online transmissions and stream like you meet it. From BSW Broadcast Supply Worldwide, where the very sporting specials are on right now. Get a great deal on a sports broadcasting package and sound better than ever. And by Lavo, providing seamless integration of your work processes and the uncomplicated operation of complex technology. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twerked. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Delighted to be here. And here is at the at, at the Hampton by Hilton Hotel in Amsterdam. We're in an area that's called, how do you pronounce this, this, this arena thing here? Uh, Bill, by Bill? Belma. Bel- Belma. 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 Belma Arena area. Okay, so that's, that's where we are. And we're just in the conference center over here. They graciously let us make this uh, Skype. Uh, call from here. This is the show where we talk about radio technology, everything from the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower and everything in between. And on this show, we're going to be talking a lot about audio processing because we have a couple of audio processing gurus here. And by the way, my co-host, I noticed Chris, wherever you are, you're close to some Omnia audio processors right there. What you got? And welcome in. <laughs> Why, thank you. Yes, I'm. Uh, it's good to see you, gentlemen. It's, I think NAB was the last time we got together. Uh, yes, I'm at the transmitter site. That is a uh, Omnia 6 EXI HDFM uh, up there. Oh, and there's also a uh, Omnia 1 and Omnia 1. So we've got three Omnias going. It's pretty oh, good. Oh, two Omnia 1s. Holy cow. Yes. Who would have thought? And then, and then so I'm guessing the those two, your, your FM and your HD2 and HD1, 2, and 3? HD2, uh, the other one is doing a backup for my main transmitter. I have to uh, do some work on the primary processor. So that's my ah, backup. Cool. You yeah. got a backup. Good idea. So, yeah. so, Chris, we're live in Amsterdam. It's, it's uh, after 11 o'clock at night here. I mean, it's bedtime. Uh, these guys agreed to, to stay up late. Tell me about what's going on uh, in your life this week. This week has been a week of recording uh, jazz artists. We've been we've back to back. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we, it was, uh, wow, one, two, three, four, five different artists. We had an art gallery show. We do an art gallery at the station every three months. And this one we had was Adriana uh, Mateo. It was uh, all the jazz artists. You can name Jimmy Heath, uh, you name it, John Baptista, everybody. A nice, huge 33-inch black and white prints. Uh, it was a great turnout. It was, uh, we have music. It was, it was fun. So it's been a very busy week recording. And then our pledge drive begins today. So we, we begin the drive to help support the station, get things moving. This is a public radio station that I work with. Awesome. Sounds like a, sounds like a good week. Uh, obviously, uh, I've had a good week. Last, on Thursday, we did our show live from the headquarters of Broadcast Bionics in a little town called Hayward's Heath, which is uh, essentially south of uh, London. And uh, then I got to visit um, a BBC uh, regional uh, or I guess a local B- BBC local radio station uh, last week. Uh, it's BBC Kent, so it's I guess in the county of Kent is is where it gets that name. And then uh, on uh, Monday, this past Monday, I got to visit uh, BBC Broadcast House, uh, both the old Broadcast House and the new Broadcast House, which are connected together. Mm-hmm. One's just kind of remodeled, and uh, saw some amazing things that uh, have to do with the whole realm of virtual radio where the BBC is, uh, they have equipment at the studios out in the, uh, out in the local towns, but uh, all of the automation and actually the console mixing engines uh, and all the audio processing, that goes on uh, at, w- at two different uh, data centers, uh, or as they call them, uh, Vylor uh, remote centers um, that, that handle all that back end. So they have minimal equipment out in the field. It still looks like a radio station, but they have all the all the heavy duty uh, work uh, is done in, in the data center. So pretty interesting concept and uh, it, it amazingly compact um, the, the way they've done it. Wasn't allowed to take too many pictures. So I can you know, on a future episode, we'll show you pictures from the local station in Kent. But at the super secret uh, data center was not allowed to take any pictures there. But I can tell you it was it was very compact. I mean, they were they're basically they have up up to f- about 40 radio stations in five racks in London. 
and then five similar racks uh, in uh, in Manchester. So that's their that, that not just a backup. They're both online full time. So it's pretty cool. So, but that's not what we here, came here to talk about. Uh, by the way, our show this week in Radio Tech. Before we talk about audio processing with Hans and Matt, uh, and I, you know what? I guess I should go ahead and introduce them and then get to our first commercial. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to start with Matt over here. Matt's from the U.S. Uh, you live around Columbus, Ohio, right? Yep, that's correct. And you're doing you're doing engineering for some stations in the area, right? Uh, and unfortunately, they scheduled the Ohio Broadcasters Conference. Uh, like for Tuesday, and right, you yes. can't attend. Right, and I, I'm very disappointed. I look forward to that show every year, actually. Yeah, that's I, that's the first time I met you in person, I believe. Yeah, that's I show. think so. Yeah. So you also do some audio processing consulting. Uh, you work with Hans uh, mm -hmm. when he needs some help, and tell me about, about that. Well, uh, Hans and I got together, what, about a year and a half ago? Yeah, it's the um, Yeah, so NAB, before NAB last year, and I'd already been kind of testing and playing with Stereo Tool, and um, a mutual friend connected us, and we uh, kind of got together, and I came out and helped to work his booth at NAB last year, and it worked out really well, and he brought me here last year, and then again at NAB this year, and here I am again at IBC this year. So um, it's been a lot of fun, and I've been able to work with a couple of stations uh, to implement Stereo Tool in the U.S., and... Um, also help Hans with development on some new cool features in Stereo Tool. So it's been a lot of fun. So Hans here, the inventor, uh, who I think you were on the show once before, and you told me you didn't really have a background in, in audio. Uh, no, I didn't. You had a background in writing software for medical systems. Uh, yeah, more yeah. others. Yeah. 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 So Hans von Sutphen uh, has a, a couple of different processing interests. One is Stereo Tool, which is a, a software processor that you can purchase over the web and install it on a PC, right? Yep. And then uh, you also do development for my employer, uh, the Telus Alliance, and you have mm -hmm. products that are going into uh, that are Omnia processors. Yeah. Yep. Uh, my Clipper is in the uh, nine and seven and nine SG now, and the D Clipper is in the nine and the eleven and the seven. Mm -hmm. And now there's a new product, Omnia SSD, and we also have another new product, Micro MPX. So I guess we'll go into those uh, yeah, in a moment. We we absolutely will talk about those. Uh, th this audio processor we're going to be talking about, the Omnia SST uh, software processor, and then again, Hans's ideas have, he's been collaborating with uh, Leif Clayson uh, in the Omnia 9, and uh, maybe some things will go in the Omnia 7 as well, and maybe there's going to be something new eventually from Omnia. I, I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, you'd think that they're, they're probably working on some cool stuff together. Our show, This Week in Radio Tech, is brought to you by my friends at Lavo, L-A-W-O dot com. And hey, when you go to that website to check out what they do, please use our special code. Uh, it's uh, lavo.com slash twirt. So L-A-W-O dot com slash T-W-I-R-T. And if you go to that website uh, right now or it's shown on the screen, you're going to see some of the things that they do. Now, if you hit the, if you do the lavo dot com slash twirt, it's going to take you right to the radio on air section of their website. Now, you know, Lavo makes a lot of things. They make enormous audio consoles. I just walked by one of them today during setup at NAB, and they make some pretty impressive consoles, and they're bulletproof. I mean, they're really st strong uh, German engineering with uh, redundant systems. Hey, if you're going to be you know, broadcasting the Olympics or the World Cup, uh, other big events, uh, you're going to need to have a console and a system that is very reliable. Well, they've put that kind of reliability into their radio consoles as well. So Lavo has radio consoles. They have consoles that, uh, well, they've called virtual radio now for a couple of years. This is a console that you control on a multi-touch touchscreen. We've talked about that uh, here on the show before. Uh, they have routing systems uh, based on Ravenna and also TDM uh, routing as well. Uh, there's a, In fact, there's a big Ravenna booth uh, here here at IBC, just like there always is. In fact, I just saw Andreas. Is it Andreas uh, Hilmer? Uh, um, something like that. So, so I, uh, well, I'll call him Andreas. <laughs> Andreas, I saw him today <laughs> Yeah, at the uh, Ravenna booth. So that's part of what Lavo does. So you have AES-67 compatibility there with that. So if you're building on a system, you want AES-67 compatibility, you've got it. Um, virtual radio, this is a product called Relay from Lavo. Uh, you can basically carry a radio station around with you in a bag. You know, your PCs now are just so capable 
that they can handle phone calls and codecs and automation and mixing with auto mix all at the same time. And that's what Relay offers. And then there's their new Ruby audio console. This is getting a lot of talk around IBC. It did last year. They introduced it last year and gaining some traction now. It's a console that actually combines traditional faders and controls, just like you'd expect, you know, hardware, but also a touchscreen that lets you get into the more complex features uh, in the Ruby console. So that's awfully cool. It uses just a one rack unit um, uh, input, output, and mixing box. And then the, the console itself uh, you know, sits on your desk. It's, it's modular. Uh, it's very cool. It's the, the Ruby console from Lavo. Hey, I'd like you to check these guys out. Uh, maybe they have something that you're looking for with the features like auto mix that they've had for a while now and also the uh, automatic level setting on your guests. So you got people coming in on microphone. You have no idea how loud or how talk, uh, soft they're going to talk. Uh, use the automatic feature function that sets the preamp level just exactly right. Check them out at lavo.com, L-A-W-O dot com slash twerk. Thanks very much, Lavo, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, here we are back at uh, uh, Amsterdam at the um, Hampton by Hilton Hotel here, and we're starting IBC tomorrow. Hans, I'm going to start with you and um, ask you, first of all, let's talk about your uh, business that, that you've been in since before uh, you came to be a consultant with the Telos Alliance and Omni, and that's uh, your product, Stereo Tool. Yeah, mm -hmm. tell me, tell me about about Stereo Tool. Uh, well, a number of years ago, actually in two thousand one, I think it was, I started an internet radio station, and I needed some processing for it. And yeah, I'm one of those weird people who everything wants to do everything themselves. So I made my own playout system and my own <laughs> everything basically. And yeah, one of the things was the processing, and yeah, that's. Well, was that that was for a while just a bunch of command line tools that I would run one after another of the audio, mm. and then when I was going from one company to another, and that was two months in between, I wanted to learn something with Visual Studio and uh, yeah, uh, C plus plus basically because yeah. I had no experience yeah. with it. I had studied computer science, but well, we had we have learned stuff about it, but that was basically all theory. So I wanted to uh, to try to use it in practice, and I needed some sort of project to uh, test it with. So I thought, oh, let's just make a GUI around these uh, these 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 things that I have made. Ah. And I did that, and then didn't think about it anymore. And almost a year later, I found a site where I could upload it, and then within a week, I had five thousand downloads. <laughs> and within two months or three months, there were ninety thousand downloads. So. Yeah, then I thought, okay, let me let, let's make a newer version of it. <laughs> and from there it kind of got out of control. Yeah. More and more until the point uh, about five and a half years ago where it was just taking up so much of my time that I couldn't combine it with my regular job anymore. Mm -hmm. So I quit that and just went with Stereo Tool full time. So this original Stereo Tool was only uh, was optimized for web streaming. Yeah. The original, ver yeah, the original version. Oh, this will maybe come as a shock for some people, but the original version was actually I only used that thing on uh, on on hard trends. So basically, really hard music, uh, ah. dance music. Yeah, yeah. And that's what it's actually made for with a lot of bass and. <laughs> okay. Okay. And. Yeah, and now people are using it for everything, but yeah, that was not what I originally uh, made it for. Of course, now it's optimized for everything. But uh, right, you, so you have uh, plugins or versions or controls for AM broadcasting, FM broadcasting. Last time I counted, I had five thousand sixty controls that all do something with audio. Oh my goodness! <laughs> okay, so this well, you're making it sound complicated now. Yeah, but, but sorry, no, it's it's very simple to use. Just just download it and. <laughs> uh, so I, I want to ask Matt about this. So Matt. You and I, similar, we're uh, American-based engineers, right? Yep. And uh, so uh, what, what was your first impression in downloading and trying out Stereo Tool? Well, you know, obviously, I'm a long-time Omnia user, so for my FM stations, uh, I've used the Omnia products, but I'm always into processing. It's kind of a uh, side hobby passion of mine. Sure. And um, a friend of mine told me about it, because uh, I was looking for something to do. We were going to spool up an HD2 and HD3, and I needed something quick and simple and, uh, and inexpensive to get processing for them. I'm like, hey, you should check this software out. And I'd never heard of it, and I did, and I was blown away. Um, started playing with it and uh, hooked up with some people that had used it, started building presets for it. And, you know, one of the things I love about it, that I tell people, is 
it, you really can get in there and start learning what different sections of a processor do because you can isolate them, turn them on and off. Um, and he's actually got a monitor feature where you can actually hear just that effect. So if you want to hear what just the bass enhancer is doing, you oh. can hear just the bass enhancers, like almost a, a mix minus kind of thing. So it's just the bass enhancer. Uh, you can pull your individual bands out. So if you hear a frequency that's kind of like, ah, oh, I hear something I don't like, you can monitor that band and go, aha, there it is. And that's one thing very unique about Stereo Tool and now SST that you can't do with any other processor. Hmm. So that was one of the things I was just like, wow, this is so neat. So it really helped me even learn more about this this hobby passion of mine. You know, this is probably a good time. And hey, Chris, Tobin, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask Matt to take us through a little tutorial uh, just thinking about the different sections from, from first to last of an audio processor. Just, you know, I, I want Matt to pretend he's talking to a newbie. What is audio? Pro <laughs> what is each section doing for you? Um, and, and Chris, you know, I, I, I'm always looking forward to, to learning. And, you know, you and I have both set up plenty of audio processors. But Matt may say something that uh, r reminds us, oh, yeah, yeah, I need to pay more attention to this or that. Or So uh, I'm going to get to the details in a few minutes with you. But uh, let's have you, if, if you're talking to a newbie, hey, I just got a radio station. I just started an Internet station. Uh, tell me what you, what, why do I need audio processing and what does each part of the processor do for me? Can you give us a little five minute sure. tutorial? I mean, okay. first of all, consistency, dynamic consistency and spectral consistency are why you need an audio processor. Um, also, oh, if, if I play songs, some are really bassy, some are have too much high end. You said consistency. This makes, doesn't make songs sound alike, but it makes the listening experience pleasant for hour after hour. Yeah. Right. You know, one of my goals when I set a processor up is A, I want the levels to be consistent from song to song, uh, yeah. but I don't want to hear the AGCs working. I want them to be transparent. And secondly, I want the spectrum to be consistent from song to song. Like you said, I don't want every song to sound the same, but I don't want one song to come on with so much bass that it darn near blows your speakers. And then the next song comes on and there's no bass. And now all of a sudden, the highs are so high, the tweeters are just screaming at you. So there's got to be a way to balance that out song to song, keep spectrum consistent and the dynamics consistent mm -hmm. so um uh when you when you're running some software or playing with an audio processor what happens to the audio when it first comes in the processor what's the first stage well your first stage is always going to be your wide band agc so and kind of the way i look at each stage is your first stage it goes kind of goes from larger amounts of gain control but slower time constants mm -hmm. and then as you go through it gets less amounts of gain changing um, but faster time constants. So your your wideband AGC is kind of your slow leveler that you really shouldn't hear, but that's what's basically changing those levels in large amounts to keep the dynamics consistent. Then you move on to your multiband um, compression or AGCs. Mm -hmm. that's, gonna, that's where your spectrum consistency comes into play in traditional processors. Now, you know, in the, in the 11 and now in Stereo Twin SST, there's a new thing that fixes that even better. Oh. Um, but Hans can talk to that. Okay. Uh, but typically in traditional processors that we've had for umpteen years, your kind of your, your comp compression or where things kind of get denser mm -hmm. and all your spectrum correction all come in that second stage, your multiband compressors or AGCs. And by the way, multiband implies that the bass is divided, the audio is divided up into uh, bass and, and middle and highs and actually some divisions between those. Mm -hmm. And so you have different sections, wor I mean, different sections working on different parts of the audio. Right. Right. Uh, the, the the low bass, the then where the vocals are and then where the trumpets and stuff is and then yeah. the high stuff where cymbals may be. Yeah. Yep. So, and by controlling it this way, that's how you get consistency from song to song in terms of bass and treble and vocal and things like that. Yep. Correct. Okay. okay. All right. So and then so you move on from your ADCs or compressors, which are kind of working more in the RMS realm. So now you move on to your multiband limiter stage, which now you're getting into the peak realm. So this is going to come into play with songs that have a lot of uh, peaky dynamics, which for a while there wasn't much, but it's getting a little better again. Um, and obviously when you're in stop sets and dry voice, you really want to see those limiters work and to tame those peaks down, uh, the bulk of the peaks. Now the finite peaks or the real fast ones, that's where that hits your clipper, the final stage. Mm -hmm. And that's for the last thing that kind of smashes everything down, uh, typically in a broadband sense, uh, either be it left, right, uh, in traditional processors or in the composite realm with stereo tool, SST, and lace processors. You know, one thing that I, I describe to people, what does a processor do? Our ears, 
here pretty much based on, you mentioned RMS, root mean square, or knows the power that's in each band or in the overall audio. Our ears respond to that. But a, a broadcast transmitter or an internet encoder responds to the peak value of the audio, peaks that are so fast that we don't really hear them, although we, we don't want to clip them like square waves, but we don't really hear them so well. They don't really add much to the energy, but the transmitter does respond to that. And so the idea is to get the RMS level up appropriately mm -hmm. and to get the peaks down so that the transmitter's behavior and our ear's behavior are, are more in, in sync with each other. Right, but the trick now is, as we're learning with better processors, uh, is to get the RMS energy up and the peaks down but without making it sound crushed. Yes. One of the things yeah. that we've fought for all these years um, is to get that to where we want it for the transmitter in our ears, it has created this completely crushed sound that just takes every bit of dynamic detail or transient detail out of all the music. And you're just going, man, that's just a squashed wall of sound. Yeah. And now there's better ways to do it, better clippers and where you can actually get those peaks down, but the music still has some transients and some dynamics to it. At least it sounds like it does. Got you. And that's what we're going to ask uh, Hans about right now. Hey, Chris, uh, have I missed anything yet on ex explaining uh, with Matt here, an audio processor? What do you tell people? No, no, he, he did, he's spot on. I, I tell people the same thing. I've worked at stations where the format was, uh, how would you say, I guess it was like jazz and soft, and people thought we were too loud because I tuned it so that you could be in a car with the windows open and still hear the uh, finer points of the music. But we, yes, dealing with the dynamics and the peaks and trying to find that happy balance, and that's right, it's been always a challenge, and the newer processors and the technologies made it much easier to achieve it but it's also made it too easy to sort of tweak and turn things and go, wow, look at that, and realize, oh, that was a bad move on my part. Uh, but <laughs> no, he's right. <laughs> and you know you know exactly what I'm talking about because I've heard it in some markets where like, wow, that's really loud and punchy, but I think they went a little too far on that, that knob. As I uh, told a friend of mine who uh, works with processing, I always say, I said, you know what, I start at zero on the knob and I go backwards to the minus side. And they laugh at me and he's like, Really? I was like, yeah, today's processes, and Hans knows, the DSPs are real real finite when it comes to certain settings. And if you go in the plus side too much, you, you it just doesn't work. That's just me. I mean, I got a processor up here that I'm doing the opposite of what everybody thinks. And uh, I'm pretty loud and competitive in the number one market, and we're playing jazz. Yeah, that's that's cool. And and this, this y you're right. You know, earlier processors... Uh, have and even still some today are designed kind of in a mathematical sense. In other words, yes. if you're using a, a program, and I, I don't mean to pick on it, but if you're using Adobe Audition and you apply an audio processor into it, um, there's a lot of math involved, but I'm not sure how much bioengineering there is involved or, or psychoacoustic engineering there is involved. And that's where um, the secret sauce comes in in a lot of processors. Uh, guys like uh, Frank Foti, and uh, Cornelius Gould, Leif Clayson, um, and Hans here understand, you know, I can, I can make the audio all be really loud, but then it's not really pretty. Let me make it pretty and still competitively loud. So I'd like for Hans to, you know, I know you can't give away any secrets because uh, there's secret things that you do. do that all, uh, <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> no. <laughs> so tell you what, uh, uh, Bill, before we get into real specifics with like an Omni SST, mm. maybe you can tell us, you know, uh, some of the things that you have found in generalities that help keep music sounding dynamic and yet make it come out your speaker at a consistent level. Hmm. Let me think about <laughs> that. Uh, there are so many things. It's all different. So yeah. I cannot really give you one thing that will well, do that. Well, uh, Matt mentioned time constants. Mm. And so I, I, but I bet you there are a lot of, there's some, I bet you there are things that you do or are often done that are, program-based time constants, depending on what what the audio is doing, do you change the way the processor behaves? I don't really do that. Oh. I do it, well, a bit maybe, but not as in that I designed it that way, but more that I create some algorithm that automatically does respond to, well, in more dynamic music, it will move faster, but not because the time constants change, but oh. because that's just how the thing is designed. Okay. So this is, ah, this is the thing that I've, yeah, I talked to people about uh, in the previous years when uh, with compression. So, ah, th this is actually uh, this is actually a funny story. So, 
about two years ago, I wanted to redesign my compressor. And I have to say, making a good sounding compressor is one of the most difficult things in a processor. More difficult than a declipper, mm -hmm. more difficult than a good clipper. Now you're talking about a, a, a compressor that sounds good because you yeah. can you can go to a textbook and and get some formulas sure. Sure. and plug those formulas into MATLAB or whatever you're using, uh, but that's not necessarily going to sound pleasing to the human ear. No. Okay. No. And the thing is that with many things such as a clipper or declipper or yeah many other things, you basically know what the end result has to be. For a clipper, it's pretty simple. You put something in, and the less you change the sound that comes out compared to what got, what went in, the better the clipper is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can measure it, you can look at scopes, you can you can do anything and just determine if a clipper is better or not. With the compressor, you have to use your ears because you cannot measure it. Mm. And you actually have to train your ears and that takes time. Ah, so it takes listening to a lot of music and other sounds through the compressor to figure out what's working well and yeah. what's not. Yeah, and it, in, at least in my case, it took many generations of compressors before I was really happy about it. So my current design that I've been using for the last few years is actually based on uh, the behavior of water pressure control systems. Okay, so, so w water pressure control can tell us something about how we hear audio, huh? Or how we control well, audio. The idea was that if you make a compressor that you could actually build from 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 real hardware, so, so from from stuff, pistons and tubes and things like that. No, oh. not even that. Just oh. just some wood or I don't oh. know, a rubber and thingies okay. and okay. just. I'm talking about water pressure control. So yeah, we have yeah. we have a system here where you where you squeeze water in and it has to respond to that somehow. Okay. So basically, we I. Uh, Talked to an engineer who worked at a local station in the Netherlands, uh, Joop Krauthausen, and he uh, he works at a company where they make those systems. And I just coincidentally visited him one night, and we ended up sitting there till 5 a.m. writing down formulas and uh, models. And then after that, I started programming for about two months, and I also added some other things like uh, hydraulic doors. So you know you know those doors that close down at a certain speed and you can push against it and they don't go faster oh, yeah, yeah. and they have oil pressure things yeah. and so the oil heats up if you push against it and that all led to some model which led to a new compressor design huh i actually even talked to an architect about it to get some details about how <laughs> these doors work oh, okay okay <laughs> so yeah I, I really wanted to have a model that's really uh that, that matches something real and I've discovered since that every time I try to add something and I try to take a shortcut and just do something, mm -hmm. it just damages the sound. And I have mm -hmm. to go back to the original design and change the design that I have and the model that I have again to something that you can actually build. And as long as I do that, it seems to sound good. We're going to uh, take a break here in just a moment. But when we come back, um, Hans, I I'd like for him to describe uh, you know, how he kind of how he implements ideas into stereo tool because I think you get a lot of feedback from from users and uh, how he you know makes that happen and then we'll get around to talking about uh, a little bit about um, a subject that we talked about at NAB time which was a uh, a, a paper uh, talking about how you are able to do some amazing things to fit more into the envelope the FM envelope and therefore produce more sound out of you know yeah. like fill up all the spaces. So we'll, we'll do that in just a minute. Our show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at bswusa.com. That's broadcast supply worldwide. And yeah, that's their website, bswusa.com. They're having right now a very sporting special sale. You can save up to 42% at their very sporting sale. You get great gear at special prices from Comrex, Audio-Technica, HDV Mixer, and more. But you do need to act fast because the sale ends soon. We're in September right now, and I don't think this is going to go much past the end of September, um, if, if at all past. So you need to give them a call. Uh, by the way, if, tell you what, I'll go ahead and give their phone number. You can jot it down and give them a call at 800-426-8434. Uh, they do sell in the U.S., uh, so it's 800 
426-8434. Now, what are some of the specials? Well, for example, Comrex has this new Access NX. That's a revolutionary redesign of their popular IP audio codec. Gives you faster processors, automatic error correction, and a convenient, very intuitive touchscreen. Uh, and it's a lot bigger, too. It's, it's really cool looking. Uh, your sports people will have no problem operating that in the field and connecting back to the radio station. Uh, they also have head uh, headphones on sale. These are headsets, I should say. Headphones plus a microphone. And I've got these. i got four of these. In fact, I bought them from BSW. Uh, it's the Audio-Technica BPHS-1. Now, these headsets, you get three of them for the price of two. That's their special. Uh, the mic delivers focused voice reproduction while it's closed back ear cups seal out background noise, and they have it ready to go with installed XLR and quarter-inch connectors. Um, so check that out. The three-pack deal on Audio-Technica headsets. It's what we use at This Week in Radio Tech. They also have um, another cool headset. It's 42% off on the Bayer Dynamic DT290 MK2. I know it's a mouthful, but it feels great on the head, and that mic sounds off, uh, sounds uh, uh, awesome, too. It offers superb sound quality, strong ambient noise attenuation, and a wide frequency range, and it's pre-wired with XLR and quarter-inch connectors. Now, if you're doing any of your broadcasting on the web, you're going to be interested in the Sports Video for Radio package. This is the HDV Mixer, and we've seen this demonstrated uh, on our show uh, a few weeks ago when we were at the podcast convention. Uh, John Lynch demonstrated the, the Sports Video for Radio uh, uh, package. You get um, cameras, two cameras. You get uh, graphics with lower thirds, and uh, live streaming is included. And uh, it's just amazing. You can get kits that even include the laptop PC, so you're ready to go. Just Take it out with you in the field. Put a couple of cameras on your football game, uh, whatever sports you're doing. Hey, even a tiddlywinks match, you can televise that uh, over uh, over your web stream. Really cool the way that works. So these sales are going on right now, up to 42% off of the very sporting specials at Broadcast Supply Worldwide. Remember, they have a warehouse that is next to an airport, a big airport in Columbus, Ohio. So if you order anything by 7 p.m. Eastern time, if it's in the warehouse, and most things are, uh, they can put it on a plane and have it to you the next day if you want, or two-day delivery or standard ground delivery. But they have choices. If you need to want something the next day, and I've done that before, you can get it from Broadcast Supply Worldwide. Again, the website, bswusa.com. Thanks a lot, BSW, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack here along with Matt Levin and Hans von Zutphen. Uh, Chris Tobin is in his studio in New York City. Chris, uh, welcome back, and uh, you've got processors in front of you. And uh, tell you what, if, if you would, <laughs> tell us again real quickly what those processors are doing, and then we'll re re rejoin Hans with a detailed explanation of some stuff. Sure, sure. I got a pair of Texars into an Optima with a modified Card 5. Oh, sorry. That was a time <laughs> That's a different time. Uh, <laughs> come on. you got to have a little fun with that. What, what is this, 1986? <laughs> <laughs> well, you were talking about processes mathematically done, and I remember working at several stations where the audio cons uh, program consultants would come in with a sheet of paper and say, okay, you've just purchased the Optimod with the modified card 5 and the Texars. Here are the voltages you need to set them to so we have the pre signature sound of the radio station. And I'd look at it and go, really? This is how it's going to work? All right. Needless to say, as Matt pointed out, that dynamic to peak range adjustments, they never really came into play properly. So... Moving forward to the future, where we are today in the present, we have an Omnia 6 EXI, which is the primary program uh, processor, doing very well with some special settings I can't show you. You know, i got to do the old play of that trick. Here we go. <laughs> That's right. You can tell I've done this before because I had it ready to go. And then so just Chris, below that. that we're, not, we're, we're not putting your preset in, in the show notes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you don't want to do that. No, no, no. Corny okay. was actually very helpful and helped me with this about a year or two ah. ago. Um, right. And then I have two Omnia ones. Uh, one is currently operating for the HD2, and the other one is was for HD3 for some projects we were doing. Well, that's offline at the moment. So right now it's acting as my backup to the other guy so I can have something in case of, just in case. All right, fine. I'll take this off. But... Uh, that, that's the processing we have going on here. I've worked with the Optimods as a station I also help out, uh, consult with um, from time to time. They have an Optimod upstairs that does very well. And I will say earlier, Kirk, you were talking about how you know Frank and everybody has a certain approach. The two people that I have to give credit to, from my understanding, is both Frank 
and Bob Orban. Yes, I know. I said those two names in the same sentence. That's okay. <laughs> sure. Because they take two different approaches, which are both successful, depending on which room you're in, but they're very good approaches. But I think their, how would you say, rivalries helped all of us to understand and take a nicer approach or a more intelligent approach to audio processing. Just as Hans pointed out with the, the water pressure, the pumps, and the concept of the, the fluid dynamic principles, it's the same thing. Those two gentlemen forced everybody to rethink and look at stuff a different way. So kudos to them and also to the two gentlemen with you, Matt and Hans, because they're taking the same approach but modernizing it even more. That's just my two cents. So, uh, sound, that was a lot more than two cents. That was very good. Thanks a lot. Oh, hey, hey Chris, there's one question I want to ask you. So could you describe it, you know, the, the elevator speech style? Um, what's the difference between the way you process for FM and the way you process for one of your HD channels? What's that fundamental difference there? Well, the fundamental difference is uh, the FM we know is full bandwidth. I'll just use those terms. Whereas the HD channel is not a, it's, it's, it's full bandwidth, but it's what they call bit reduced. So think of it as like MP3 signals for those of you who are not familiar with all the special di digital. So you process without yeah. preemphasis. You don't have to worry about the preemphasis part, the curve that we have to compensate for with FM reception and transmission. So you have actually a flat signal that you can play with and do a lot more. So uh, processing then is a bit reduced approach, so you have to be careful how you mix those channels. So if you do multi-band processing, which most people do, the summing errors that you can get from bringing in those uh, bands, if it's three, four, five, six, or some people have 22 bands of processing, it's more noticeable on FM, but it could be even greater of a notice on, on bit reduced signals like HD. So that, that's the differences there. It's real straightforward, but you do need to approach it differently. Do not expect it to be the same. Good. Okay. All right. Let's get back to Hans now. And uh, let's see, we were talking about your development process. And uh, on the last time you were with us, which has been a couple of years ago on the show, mm -hmm. uh, you were telling me how you got a lot of feedback from your stereo tool customers, and that helped you refine it and refine it to what you have today. So tell me about a little bit about that process. Oh, well, basically, I have a forum and people will just post things on it. And for example, oh, I hear something in this song which doesn't sound right or yeah, things like that. And mm -hmm. then I look into it and if I find something wrong in my code, then I change it. Or I add something and that's why there are now 5,060 settings. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah. Now, it, like for folks, uh, and I'll, I'll ask Matt this because uh, he, he talks to a lot of people. So if people want to try Stereo Tool, you don't have to be a broadcaster to give it a try, right? You can try it out and make a web stream or just listen to the input and the output. If you want to find out about processing, is there a free or a low-cost version of Stereo Tool that you can play with for a while? Absolutely. There's a standalone version that you can tie to a sound card and run it as a standalone processor. Or there's a, a DSP plugin that you can use with Winamp or other kind of internet based broadcast automation software programs mm -hmm. like Radio DJ, Sam Broadcaster, there's a few others I can't think of. But absolutely. In fact, um, when I want to start a new preset from scratch, I'll actually load up a Winamp playlist. Mm -hmm. uh, of some of my music from my radio station and waveform and sit there and build the preset in Winamp and then export it out to my full version running on a computer down in the server room and then fine tune it through an exciter. What do engineers, what's their reaction when they think, instead of running a hardware appliance audio processor, I'm going to put stereo tool or we'll talk about Omni SST on a PC and run that. What's their reaction, and, and how can you assure them that, no, this is really okay. You can make this reliable. Well, I, I, I'm sure you get the same thing, too. A lot of people are like, oh, a computer at the transmitter site. But, um, you know, the reality is we all run our automation software on computers, and sure. we expect that to run 24-7. Now, is it in a lightning-heavy environment? In most cases, not. But... Um, what I don't think people realize is a lot of those 2U and 3U appliance boxes that they buy, like even some satellite receivers and some uh, current audio processors, sure. are running computers inside of them. Yeah. So it's disguised, and you don't know it, but they're running computers inside of them. Now, can they be built a little more resist resilient to lightning and such? Yes. So, I mean, there are still risks involved if you've got a really lightning attractive site and you're not doing proper grounding. Um, but if you've got a well-built site, a well-engineered site, and it's grounded properly and everything's on UPSs, 
there's absolutely no reason to be afraid to run a computer. And I would go one step further, if you're really that worried about it, build a server grade uh, computer. Because all of the stuff that I build that I'm running Stereo Tool and SST on is all server grade, Intel Xeon, Supermicro chassis. So it's it's been very reliable. It's something that I've done recently at my radio stations was uh, I bought some uh, on the used market, uh, some Dell servers, and they were incredibly inexpensive, like mm -hmm. under $300. And I had server grade hardware. Now, yes, it was several years old. You know, you might be looking at a sooner power supply. They have redundant power supplies. Right. Is that a good option to go buy a $300 used server? Absolutely. I mean, Hans can confirm, but you don't need a ton of horsepower. I mean, as long as it's, uh, I've even gotten it to run on a Core 2 Quad, a high, a late generation Core 2 Quad. Ah. That's kind of where I would say the bare minimum is. Mm -hmm. But I would say anything Core i5 class in the Xeon realm or newer, um, or more, more more powerful is going to be more than enough, even the first generation stuff. Got gotcha. you. Cool. Okay. So we've got, we, oh, uh, if people want to download Stereo Tool and try it out and try to understand audio processing better, where would they find that? At StereoTool.com. In, oh, fact, really? okay. in fact, Hans okay. just redid his website. It's slick. Ah, okay. All right. <laughs> Webmeister. <laughs> well, I didn't do it myself. Oh, so okay. it was the same company that did the web interface for Omnia SSD, which we'll get into in a moment. So. Oh, okay. All right. All right. See, the, the magic is leaving now. I thought you designed all that. No. Oh, oh, so, oh yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So stereotool.com is where you can download an audio processor and play with it. And then if if people if somebody likes it and they say, "Hey, I want this to be a real audio processor on my radio station." Uh, I'm guessing they probably have to have a sound card that puts that can put out a multiplex if they're using it for FM, yes, puts out a multiplex signal. So what what class of sound card are we talking about here to to put out an, an FM multiplex signal? Well, basically anything that can do 192 kilohertz sample rate. Oh. Um, now with a lot of the consumer cards, there is something called tilt correction that has to be done. Yeah. Um, that's a slider in the um, FM output sound card section of Stereo Tool, and Hans has got a great video. Uh, explaining exactly how to do that. Um, you can either do it with a mod monitor, uh, your um, modulation meter and your transmitter, or even an oscilloscope. If you have got an oscilloscope laying around, plug it in and you can actually see mm. the tilt when you go to do your square wave adjustment. So uh, it's it sounds scary, but I promise it's actually really easy. Um, and this is to make up for shortcomings in a cheaper sound card correct. that still does 192 kilohertz. Correct. Right? Okay. Correct. Okay. Now, the best way to do it is digital MPX, which a lot of, or as Omnia calls it, Omnia Direct, that a lot of transmitter manufacturers are offering. Nata was the first to do it. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, all three of my sites that I'm running this on, I'm using um, AES MPX into the Nata transmitters hmm. from the sound card, from an ASI sound card. Um, so a sound card that puts out AES, but can do one, 192 kilohertz AES. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. So now I've also done a lot of testing. In fact, my test machine that I build stuff on back at the lab um, is still using an analog exciter. Um, but all of my production online stuff is, um, thankfully, not tell transmitters and uh, digital MPX. So that's the absolute cleanest way to do it. Okay. All right, cool. All right, let's see how much time we got left. We got uh, we got about twelve minutes left, and oh, we have oh, we have a commercial. Oh, wow. So let's let's move on to Omnia SST, and this is a product that was introduced last year at the IBC show. Mm -hmm. Now it's shipping, mm -hmm. and tell me about the the concept of what Omnia SST is, and then it's got one more cool feature that called Micro MPX. But let's talk about the SST first. Okay. What's it, what's so it? Um, basically, um, Stereotool has a lot of settings by now mentioned the number and uh, that can be a bit much for people who uh, aren't an expert in audio processing so a lot of those settings are actually not really needed anymore because well they're they still have to be there because of compatibility reasons you don't want someone to upgrade and suddenly have a different sound yeah uh, but there are a lot of settings that's and 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 I also use it to I, I make something new I put it in there and then yeah, people are going to use it, and some settings will be used, and some settings will not be used. And of course, I don't really know that when I put it in there. So, basically, once the filter gets mature, and we know that it's good and it's working and it's doing what it should, then we put it into SSD. And there, uh, this other company comes into play, which is uh, making the web interface, 
who are really uh, guarding that there are not too many settings and that everything still looks uh, has a clear overview and you, you can easily see what's happening. So basically what happens is SSD gets all the working features from Stereo Tool, mm -hmm. but made easy to use and yeah, that, that's it basically. And so this is a product that uh, Omnia sells, part of the Telus Alliance, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it, you, you provide your own PC to put it on, mm -hmm. um, probably a, either a server class or a, a good strong PC. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, same requirement for the sound card if it's going to put yeah. out directly to Actually, a Actually, we should probably mention that uh, Audio Science just has a new sound card that oh. they're going to ship any time now, which will do both 192 kilohertz output to the transmitter mm -hmm. and 44.1 HD output with a resampler on the card. So you can basically mm -hmm. do everything on low latency modes. So mm -hmm. SSD can actually go down to 5.3 milliseconds if you really wanted to get low. Wow. That, and if you want that, then you do need, then the hardware requirements uh, for the PC are a bit higher than what Matt just said. Okay. But, uh, but you can go down very far if you want to. Any idea what this new ASI card costs? Uh, I think it was nine hundred something. Yeah, okay, so it's just un under a thousand dollars, plus mm -hmm. plus the PC, and mm -hmm. I kind of like well, refurbished servers myself, but I've just had good luck with them. And then uh, and then the software from Omnia, which is uh, what mm -hmm. about fifteen hundred dollars or something. Uh, no, the nope. the version without Micro MPX is nine ninety five. Oh, it's a thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool. Now you mentioned Micro MPX. We've only got a few minutes left. Yeah. I'm really excited about this technology because some people, like me, I if I had a choice about it, I'd like to have my audio processor at the studio and then send the finished product out to the transmitter site uh, uh, without much stuff at the transmitter site. Just me, I realize, uh, it just, you know, anyway, it's, it's, that's, that's, that's what I like. With today's remote control, it's probably not necessary, but I, I like it that way. Uh, so uh, micro MPX, what is the idea of this technology? Uh, micro MPX is a codec which can send the full composite signal, uh, including RDS, stereo, etc., with perfect oh, B control. It, it can do RDS. So in yeah, the yeah, Omni, can. can the Omni S SST generate RDS? Yes. Okay, so I can. So wow, that's the whole package. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's uh, that's the reason why we can make it sound so good because in the Clipper you can. But yeah, we might have time left for that, maybe. Well, let's see. Uh, let's talk about the, the, that, the, that's the clip part. But, the clip uh, part, the yeah, secret stuff. Yeah, but uh, uh, so um, Micro MPX can send that whole signal, the whole composite signal, at a bitrate of 320 kilobits. 320 kilobits. And, and most of you watching or listening to the show know what, what the composite signal is or the MPX signal. It's the left plus right, the stereo pilot, the left minus right spectrum, and then the RDS. So it's the whole package of in this case, uh, analog or an AES digital representation of analog uh, that that modulates your FM signal. That's what the exciter uses to modulate. That's what goes out over the air. So it's a, it's traditionally been a bit of a fragile signal. You need to treat it very, very carefully. And you have developed this interesting codec that um, well, keep, keeps it intact. Well, Matthijs is the main developer of it, actually. But, uh, ah. but yeah, uh, so we worked on it together. But, uh, yeah. yeah, so... Um, uh, yeah, what it does is, and I should really stress this because people, of course, know codecs and probably don't like codecs because of the sound, like MP3 and things like right. that. Right, you, you'd like it to be absolutely pristine when it yeah. arrives at the transmitter. Now, of course, at 320 kilobits, it has to be lossy. I mean, it, it cannot be lossless, but it has been really designed for use on FM. And that means we have no traditional codec artifacts like pre-ringing and all those real, really watery highs that you get in right. many codecs. So that, that's stuff that does absolutely will not happen in this codec. Now, and there are other companies that are making uh, uh, an IP system that carries a multiplex signal, but we're typically talking about three to five or even higher megabits per second to get the MPX signal. Uh, from studio to transmitter, and th there are companies making these, and they're pretty interesting. They've been deployed in some some uh, networks of stations uh, I know in the Middle East. Uh, but you're talking about a significant reduction in the bandwidth required. One of my transmitter sites ha has public internet going there. Six megabits per second is all we can get, and so that wouldn't carry much linear multiplex. Uh, you could get one signal over it. One, but, uh, yeah, but yeah. Okay, but, if you have multiple stations, then right. you're going to get it to get uh, problems. But you're talking about 320 kilobits per second, yes. and I'm delivering what is reconstructed as a full multiplex signal yep. at the transmitter. Yep. Now, what hardware is going to go at the transmitter site? 
uh, at this point, a PC or some other small device, but uh, yeah, but basically a PC. But in the future, I believe that uh, the folks at my employer, Telos, are probably working on a small appliance to do this. At least it's in the plans. Uh, they probably are. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, hey, in the moment we've got left. Um, oh, I should, oh, yeah. I should stress one more thing yeah. because you were talking about, uh, because, of course, one thing that's important for this is reliability. Sure. And there are several things that help with that. For example, you, you don't want packet loss on your connection. And, of right. course, with, with any stream, you could have that. And um, there are several methods included to, uh, to, to protect against that. For example, you have forward error correction. Forward error correction. But okay. there is also yeah. a method where you can use multiple uh, different ISPs, for example, and send it over multiple connections. And mm -hmm. then at the receiver end, it will just, so at your transmitter side, it will just combine them. And if one of the connections drops out, you won't even notice it. Yeah, so the reliability, let's say you have an internet connection and its reliability is like th three or four nines worth. Well, you're going to have some dropouts. And if you have a second connection that's three or four nines of reliability, the chances of having dropouts at the same time are very slim. So yeah. you effectively get like six nines of reliability. Well, um, hey, at my transmitter site that I was speaking of, we actually now have two IP connections there, one public internet and one private. Perfect. So we have we would have two paths. So the micro MPX technology can work over dual paths. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Now, finally, uh, okay, for you tweak, FM tweak heads, we're going to talk about uh, FM Clipper for a few minutes, just a few points from our presentation at yep. NAB. Yeah, so packing more information in, it's, it's, it's like... It's like what? What's the phone booth called on on Doctor Who? Oh, the the TARDIS. The, the, yeah, TARDIS. TARDIS yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're you're fitting more inside than yeah. can go in. So traditionally, people would just clip the left and right signal, and then you have a signal that ends somewhere, and then you put your pilots and RDS on top of it. Yeah. And you get more modulation uh, on if the transmitter. Yeah. At the output, then you will see that it doesn't look very tight. Because well, at some places the the pilot will go up, and at the same point, same time the volume will go down, or the, the audio will go down, and then in total, yeah, you're just nowhere near the top, even if you could have been otherwise. So, so the the peaks and the valleys in the pilot, and the peaks and the valleys in the RDS signal, mm -hmm. either combine constructively or destructively with the peaks and valleys in the audio, and you don't get a a firm control of your modulation because yeah. of these constructive and destructive combinings of the different signals. Yeah. Okay. So um, what we did was a few things. Uh, first of all, um, well, not clip left and right, but just the whole signal. Ah, okay. So you're not doing as much left and right clipping, but you're clipping the whole composite yeah. signal. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. And uh, that actually already gives you, well, something like two or three dBs more loudness. And actually, we, we measured the maximum peak level that could come out of it if you really throw extremely loud audio into it. And I measured the difference on the high frequencies of about 5 dB. Um, and of course, when you talk about composite clipping, for years I grew up with simple composite clipping that clipped the whole thing. Yeah, no, you don't. And then, then, then we had a pilot uh, removal and reinjection process, and that's not even as... You're doing something very sophisticated with, with composite yeah, it's, clipping. It's, it's different. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So... That already gives you quite a bit of, of extra loudness, and yeah. especially more high switch on FM is always a problem. Um, but and oh and yeah, so we actually took it. I took it a step further, and uh, so you know, single sideband stereo where yeah. you have one sideband and the other one is silent, and if you use single sideband stereo, then the peaks will be at different locations. Um, because, well, you get a waveform, you multiply it by a 38 kilohertz sine wave, because that's basically what stereo modulation is. Now, if you then take the lower part of the spectrum, double it, and remove the higher part of the spectrum, of course, you, your whole waveform looks completely different. Yeah, yeah. So, if per or per use, we check which of the two gives the lowest peaks and choose that modulation type, um, yeah, then yeah. you get less clipping. And that is adding at least another dB of loudness. So, you, so you're comparing, uh, essentially, if we transmit stereo using this method or that method or somewhere in between, yeah. which one is giving us the lowest peaks with the same volume? Mm, which yeah. is giving us the least audible clipping okay. is actually what it's doing. Uh, okay. But okay. yeah, something, something close to that. Okay, okay. Yeah. The, 
Wow. And, this, and is, this is like a, adaptive stereo modulation uh, uh, on a very frequent basis. And, and now we can get yeah. back to the original thing about the multibands because uh -huh. uh, Matt was talking about that you need to get rid of those small peaks because, well, the clipper can't handle them or the clipper will have to handle them. But this clipper, with all these tricks in it, can sometimes have up to 150% uh, peak levels on the left and right channel, even though the MPX signal is at 100%. This is the TARDIS so, effect, yeah. So, <laughs> that means that basically uh, all this extra clipping, uh, all, all this extra control of those peaks isn't necessary anymore. Oh. And that means that you can get, get a very dynamic sound, which sounds very open and still louder than anything else. And that's where we started the conversation. How do we yeah. not sound all mashed up and, and squashed and still be loud, and that's you've just brought another. Yeah, and and one response that I heard some time ago, and and actually I have been willing to say something about this for a while. So there is this one video where a, a video of about an hour of Bruce Springsteen making, I think it was Born to Run. Okay. So that's a, I'm not sure if it was that song, but that's not really the point anyway. So there's a whole video of how that track was made. And you can see that there are so many instruments in there that are really, really soft and that's that are almost inaudible. Mm -hmm. But they're all mixed in there. So they really go through the whole thing with all the different channels and all the different... There's a glockenspiel in it. Huh. In, in so, Born to Run or whatever song it was. I think it was. It was yeah, the, yeah, yeah. At, at least one of his most popular tracks. I yeah. think it was Born to Run. Yeah. So, um, and then... What people traditionally do is just clip the crap out of it. Yeah. I mean, you can do that. Yeah. Come on. Someone spent so much time on making this thing perfect. Yes. And then yes. and then you put it on a <laughs> CD clipped and you make an MP3 out of it and you clip it on FM even more. So the cool thing that I heard from one person who's using Stereotool on his FM station is their uh, program director. He was a big Bruce Springsteen yeah. fan. Okay. And he has all the CDs and he plays them, etc. And he heard one of the one of his tracks on that station running stereo tool. And he actually parked his car next to the road to listen to it because he heard all kinds of details that he had never heard before on the radio. Well, yeah, that's yeah. what you want. Yeah. Wow. What a that's good the sound that you want to get. Yeah, that's a good story. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. I wish we had more time to talk about this. Uh, uh, hey, Chris. Chris Tobin, uh, have you ever used a PC-based audio processor? I've I haven't tried this much yet. Uh, no, I have not. Nothing at full time service. No. But uh, so we're gonna have I, to each I, download I, Stereo Tool and and give it a try. Yeah, I'll give it a try. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I did use a PC to record the uh, the composite on a project couple many years ago. That was fun. Sound card, 192 kilohertz. It was it was pretty cool. But uh, I have not had a chance to really play with the Stereo Tools or any PC based audio processing recently. Gotcha. Well, I, I haven't. I, I've, I've downloaded actually Omni SST and played with it a little bit, but I really need a dedicated computer that's running on a virtual machine, and uh, I just feel like I need to put it on, on its own computer. Uh, yeah. So anyway, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So we got, we got to do that, Chris. We got to download uh, uh, Stereo Tool and then compare notes on a future show. Works for me. I know what I'm doing this weekend. Oh. And, and yeah, Matt will re recommend some presets for us. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Hey, actually, we're going to do a quick uh, commercial here brought to you by Omnia and Omnia SST because I have the expert on Omnia SST right here. Now, I know we talked yeah, about we it. We should we should uh, maybe uh, focus a little more on the differences between the two because there are more things like the low latency, which Stereotool cannot go this low, but oh, SST okay. can. So you, you've ob in, in the Omni SST product, which admittedly costs more than Stereo mm -hmm. Tool, uh, but otherwise there's a lot of similarities. Except that you said the user interface is completely it's easy, completely different, yeah, yep. and way, way, way easier to use. Um, touch oh, touch friendly. Okay. Oh, yeah. So yeah, if, yeah. if you're using and it works a touch, on, and it's, touch screen, and it's all HTML5, so you can just run it on a tablet, on on, on anything that runs a browser, basically. Oh, okay. So I can I can remote into it with a Chromebook. Yeah. yeah? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's the whole idea. And um, about the, the low latency, yeah, of course. And, and, and in case we didn't make it clear, we're talking about Omnia SST, and that's uh, the newest processor from Omnia, PC based. Okay. So let's let's continue. Uh, yeah. So latency down to about five milliseconds. Oh. Um, a lot of extra presets, which were made by people at Omnia. Um, yeah, obviously Omnia support and things like that. Yeah. 
uh, and there was more. <laughs> well, I, well, I know the big thing is so if you go into the stereo tool website, a lot of the higher potent, higher powered features in stereo tool you have to buy separate licenses for. Ah. In SST, everything's included. So, okay. Okay. so all of those extra licenses you can get that will be you know in trial mode on stereo tool, they mm -hmm. all come with SST. So, like Prego spaghetti sauce, it's in there. <laughs> and of course, and that was the thing I was forgetting. Which is really stupid. Micro MPX integration is integrated into SST. So yes. you can just in SST you type in a port number and whoop, there goes your stream to your other to your location. And and there again at this moment you would have a, a, a PC. Um, I understand somebody's got it to run on a Raspberry Pi, but I don't know if that's mm. really advisable or not. But a small PC and Actually, a one sound station card. has been running it like that for over a year now. So on uh, a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. With what kind of sound card? Uh, the Wolfs and Sirius Logic, but they are not produced anymore. So ah, okay. okay. There are others, but uh, but the, so so um, yeah. So if if you're interested in in this kind of technology, uh, go to the you can go to the Omnia website uh, at uh, you can go to omniaaudio.com. It'll redirect you, or go to telosalliance.com. Go to the Omnia section and look for Omnia SST, and th there's a picture of it right there. Transform your PC into an Omnia processor. It sounds fabulous. And if you want to take advantage of that micro MPX and actually get your composite signal to the transmitter side in 320 kilobits per second, you can do that. And you know, if you have the least bit idea about internet and IT traffic, you can make this happen and receive it at the transmitter side, turn it into MPX, and then hose it right into your transmitter. And I, I didn't realize this. You could also turn it into, as you said, AES-192 multiplex. Sure. Didn't, didn't, yeah. yeah, yeah. If you have a yeah. sound card, if you have some kind of digital output at one ninety two, then yes, right. And and so you go into a number of different transmitters now will accept AES one ninety two. Yeah. So and then peak control will be absolutely perfect. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It will be exactly. pretty close to perfect with analog if you calibrate it, or if you have a card that doesn't require calibration, but with like that audio science card and uh, more. But uh, but yeah, digital. It's uh, then you don't have to worry about anything anymore, basically. Awesome! Plug awesome. Plug it in and go. Plug it in and go. I, I got to play with that, and I've got I've got I've, I've got a demo of it on my laptop, so I've got to play with it more. Thanks a lot to Omnia Audio and the Telos Alliance with the product Omnia SST uh, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Uh, Chris, you always have a, a a tip for us. I wonder if you might be able to crank one out right now. Oh goodness gracious! Yes, a tip. I'll tell you what the tip will be. It's about UPSs, batteries, and UPS. First of all, make sure if you hear the beeping of the UPS in your studio, don't wait for it to fail. Place the order, get new batteries, and switch them out. I say yes. that only because I uh, <laughs> recently had a friend of mine uh, call me up in a panic. He goes, I'm not sure where the beeping is from. I thought it was my computer. I said, no, it was the UPS. That's what it probably happened. He goes, yeah, everything went dark, and I don't know what happened. <laughs> I said, yeah, that, that, that'll yeah. do it. So uh, just a tip. Here's what I normally do with UPSs. The ones I buy are typically floating DC, the, the true inverter type. Uh, but you can get the switching yeah. type with some non-mission critical stuff. Date the UPS. Put a date on it. Initial it. This way you know what to expect. And remember, every time you use the UPS, you're actually ticking away at the life of the battery. So don't think by recycling the UPS is a good thing on a regular basis. you got to be careful with that. Not every UPS likes that. Um, so just keep those in mind. Understand what the UPS is for, why you don't want to run it at 70% of load or 75% of load. Uh, there's a few things to watch out for, but today's tip is change the battery, date it, make sure you have one spare on the shelf if it's mission critical, like say it's your transmitter and you have them in the racks. And, and also, here's something that's really fun. I uh, Six, seven months ago, helping a friend with a project at a, at a transmitter site, had to switch out the batteries on the UPS. Interestingly enough, nobody paid attention to how they placed the UPS in the rack. You know, it's a rack mount UPS. Well, yeah. they popped the cover off to slide the battery out. Yeah. Yeah. They went they went one or two rack numbers too low. Guess what? It hits the bottom of the rack on the inside. Oh. Oh. It was an interesting night switching taking out the screws and hoisting up this what was that? It was a it was one of those like six R U UPSs and in order to get the battery Holy out. Cow. So I, that had to weigh three hundred yeah. pounds. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we did use a uh, a little pry bar to keep it up and slip it out and yeah, that's something too. So when you're putting UPS in the rack, I know we have a tendency to put everything at the bottom that we think is not important. Bad move. I always go at least two rack panels up, two, uh, three RU up, then start putting equipment in the rack. 
UPS yeah. is a good idea. Start about three RU up. Otherwise, your battery replacement will be an interesting one. So uh, I've got a, a quick tip, although I, I don't remember the name of the manufacturer. But while I was at the BBC in London at uh, New Broadcast House, I saw the most amazing tool that broadcast engineers need. Now, I bet it's expensive. I'm sure the BBC can afford it. It was a, it was a lift that was basically, it was like a little forklift, but it's for lifting a server or a UPS to the right height in the rack, and then you roll. Or it has arms. It has an arm or and a platform. You put you, it. It extends out to put your server into the rack, and then you tighten. You put your screws through and tighten them up. And this thing holds all the weight of the server, the 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 the, the network attached storage, what whatever you're putting in, probably hold the UPS. And it was just amazing. I can't imagine. I mean, this. Thing must have been a, a six thousand dollar appliance. Oh, I mean, it, it, yeah, it had you know heavy duty wheels on it, and it was a forklift for a server. Now, while I was at a different BBC station out in the country, uh, in that one in Kent, the engineer there told me about how they had to move some computers up this this big server computer actually, and they didn't have such a lift. If they couldn't go to London and get that one, apparently, so they actually had to sling some ropes around the top of the rack <laughs> and make make a cradle make a make a mount a, a lift point on the server uh that they ran the ropes through and then they they just had to move it up like four rack units to make some room for something and they did and so that's you know hey ingenuity you know can work every time but they had to do it in a safe manner and and they did so i should try to find out the model or the name of that manufacturer for the server lift. I'm sure it's expensive, but man, it can be worth it. Maybe you could borrow one from your friendly data center. You know, you know somebody that works at a data center? Uh, I have a few friends, but I've never seen something like what you're describing. Yeah, the first time I saw something like it was amazing, amazing. Hey, we got to go. Um, Chris Tobin, thank you so much for being with us. I sure appreciate you uh, hanging out there in, uh, in New Jersey for us. Thanks a lot for joining us. Oh, no problem. Well, today was uh, Times Square, New York City, but uh, yeah, that's, that's not a problem. So it's good stuff. And uh, then thanks also to staying up so late because here we are in Amsterdam and the time is 10 minutes after midnight here in Amsterdam. Matt Levin from around the Columbus, Ohio area. Yep. Yeah? Okay. Yep. Good deal. And I'm, I'm going to Columbus on uh, Tuesday, but I won't see you. Right. Sorry. I'll still be here. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I made him come here made and him. I made him stay here. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, hey, what, what's Columbus got that Amsterdam doesn't have? Hey, well, I love our Columbus show, but there is some really cool stuff here in Amsterdam, too. Yeah. There is, there is, there is. Maybe <laughs> next year they can work them out that don't occur at the same time. I, I've already brought that up to our, our great OAB staff, and they are going to make sure they don't uh, schedule it on that those dates again. <laughs> there's, so many, there's so many shows, it's hard not to it, it overlap is, it, stuff. That's the thing. They, they try to account for everything, and, and they just miss this one. So, But we have a great staff in Ohio, and... They felt terrible when I brought it up to them, so they already have this one circled on their uh, calendar for next year to stay away from it. Ah, gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. All right, and Hans von Sutphen, uh, what, what's the name of, of your company? Is it Timio? Yes. Okay, Timio, Timio Audio Technology. And if you want to um, get the benefit of all your work at Timio, you'll find it in the Omnia SST. Yep. All right, good. Thanks for, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. No problem. All righty. Hey, and thanks also to our producer, uh, Suncast, who... Uh, produces the show, deals with all kinds of problems, and makes them so they're just invisible. So we appreciate that very much. And thanks also to uh, Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network. Uh, also, thanks to our sponsors, Lavo at lavo.com slash twert. Go there. And then also BSW, Broadcast Supply Worldwide at bswusa.com. And finally, Telos Alliance, where you can find the Omnia SST. Go to telosalliance.com. That's it for us. We're back in, uh, I'm back in Nashville next week, and we're going to be talking about uh, some kind of cool things with the emergency alert system and how it behaved or didn't behave, was used or maybe misused or annoyingly used uh, during recent hurricanes that we've had in the U.S. So that'll be coming up. I think uh, Ron Hale, I believe, is our guest next week. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.